Hi, this is Jeff Heaton. In this video, I'm going to show you how to use Blender from a Python programmer's perspective. We're looking at really Python first and all of the issues that I ran into just using Blender to render some 3D images that I wanted to use with my deep learning course for training data for a Kaggle competition. So we'll see really just the fundamentals of how to use textures, how to set up primitives, how to do some basic modifications on those, and then render right to disk. I like using Blender and Python when the goal is ultimately to send the image off to a disk file rather than using something like OpenGL where you're fundamentally doing a screenshot for the, the rendering. To see all my videos about Kaggle, neural networks, and other AI topics, click the subscribe button and the bell next to it and select all to be notified of every new video. So looking at Blender, just from the perspective of a Python programmer, what we're looking at is where do you put your Python code? That's one of the first things that I'm interested in. You can run external Python scripts to Blender, but for this very, very introductory video, I'm just going to look at really the most simple path from point A to point B. And this is a Blender file. Inside of this Blender file is where all of the assets go that you're going to be creating creating with the Python script, all the meshes and other things that are going to be used to render your scenes. Now I do have some images here and all these files are available in the GitHub repository that I have linked in the description of this video. These are just some textures. I want to show you how to link textures in, how to make use of those. The Python script that I'm dealing with is right here inside of the Blender file itself. So let's go ahead and open that and we're opening up Blender. Now Blender, there's a lot to its user interface and it uses everything that your mouse has. It uses the middle button, it uses the, the scrolling trackball, everything. And it's a bit more of a Unix interface than in Windows. I mean, I'll show you some of the things that kind of would confuse you if you're not used to it. Notice I'm in the center pane here and I'm typing. If I move my mouse out of there, I can't type, even though the cursor is still there. That's very different than Windows. So just a few things to let you know that might be a little bit confusing. Now, I am right now inside of the, the scripting environment. I think they're called environments it is, or workspace. And there's several workspaces defined. These are all of them here from layout all the way to scripting. So these are just different views. I suggest going to scripting for what I told you. If you don't see scripting, click on the little plus and you can you can add it if you happen to close it or something like that. These menu buttons over here, we'll use those mostly render. That's the main menu bar. The other thing that you really want to be aware of in Blender is what version you're running. Normally you'd go to about for that, but there's a lot of about submenus. Just go to the splash screen and you can see that we are running Blender 2.0. A3.2. Blender is great for breaking changes. So if you're using older code, you'll run into issues. I'll try to keep this up to date as I am starting to use Blender for more things related to artificial intelligence and visualizations with that. Now, I normally deal with AI and visualizations for that, so that's where I'm going to have some interesting videos on here, but this video is really just all the annoying things that you would run into just to get up and running in Python with Blender. So you should be in the scripting window here and you can see this file that I've already created is the example that we're going to go through. It gives you some basic things that you can do with creating objects, putting them on, adjusting the objects, adjusting the textures, performing renders right in here. What I started using this for is I generate the covers of my books in Blender and then I have also been using this to generate training data for my students for Kaggle competitions. And you can use it for real training data too. That's been used more and more in 3D with figures of telling the, when somebody's got their hand in a certain position or other various things. So let's look at this. So where is your file actually at? You'll notice here the word text and this is, these are all the scripts that I have loaded. There's just one in here. By default, it gets named text. And this is your Python code. 
code. Scrolling to the bottom of this, we'll get through all that code in a moment, but one of the first things that I like to know about is what version of Python am I really dealing with here? And this is a Python that was built into Blender. So it's distributed with it. You can, using an environmental variable, I believe, I haven't tried this yet, have Blender use a Python completely outside of your environment, outside of itself. And you can also use pip to install additional packages inside of the built-in Blender environment. I am going to definitely do more on that, and I'll probably have a video just on that, because I really want to get PyTorch and TensorFlow Cura's working completely inside of Blender so that I can use them to help render things. I am not skilled at all in 3D modeling, but I think it's very fascinating to use artificial intelligence to generate visualizations and realistic looking things, kind of along the lines of GANs and other things. This is sort of where I'm going with this. So let's just run these three lines here because that's going to tell me what version of Python I'm dealing with and where it resides. Now I ran that and at first you might be tempted just to think, okay, that didn't that didn't do anything. But that is an important thing in, in this, and this is a little different between Windows and Mac. I'm running Windows currently. I run this on Mac as well. If you look down here, you don't really have a second window. You have to unfortunately open up a terminal or a system console and now I can now I can see more what's going on and I can see the it's we're running 3.7.4 so it's a pretty very recent version of Python and I can see where the executable is so you can see that Python is installed literally right inside of Blender and that's fine we're, I'm using vanilla Python for what I'm doing here I am definitely going to have to go in and and install other things into Python and I don't know, I, I kind of visualize I would like to have a Conda environment set up that Blender would be running to so I can really control it, archive it, and other things. I'll probably do another video on that as I get more into that. Now on Mac, you don't have that option. You've got to start this up literally from the command line so that there's a terminal window, which is a major hassle, but that's that's the way Blender Mac works. So just Google Blender. Blender Mac terminal window. You'll this is critical. You've got to have this. If you don't have this, you won't see your error messages. You can't write console log output. You've got to have this this window. Now once you've toggled it and it's on, then it's down here and you can just pop it up uh, in conjunction with Blender. The only other thing I will show you on the user interface is essentially here you have the scene, you have the Blender always puts a cube in there and a light up there and a camera. It's essentially like a photography studio. You're setting up your lights, you're setting up your camera, and then you're, you're rendering one frame. Then you move to the next. And I'm very interested in doing things that move in Blender. So I can, I can render a single frame, render all those frames, and then FFmpeg them together. I've got another video on how to use FFmpeg. So the other thing is your scene. So the scene is for one frame that you're going to render. Now, you might render just that frame. For the Kaggle competition that I did for my students, I rendered block buildings. And the students were supposed to tell me if the block building was stable or not. And I internally just used Blender Physics to tell me if it's stable. See, this one, for example, boom, falls over. Wasn't stable. It was missing a key block that would do that. I was looking to see, can the students tell this using artificial intelligence, using a neural network? And I'll probably release the source code to that Kaggle competition. It's currently running, so I'm, I'm not releasing it now, obviously. I don't want the students generating infinite training data. But inside of this scene, you have your camera cube all of these and my code that I'm gonna run here I just blow that all away and rebuild the scene completely from scratch I want this to be completely automated and that's how I'm generating these scripts you'll also see down here you've got your brushes lights all of these kind of things you can you can basically look through here and delete other things that might be there for example I've got 21 materials 
materials. I don't do the best job always in the code of cleaning these out, so sometimes I do want to go in and clean out materials that my code is creating. We'll see where those are created in, in a moment. But basically, every this current file, this is like the structure of that Blender file. So there is nothing hidden. You should be able to see everything. I don't think there's anything that accumulates lower level than even this. But the way that I built Blender files, the Python code is generating everything. So I can easily just copy this Python code and transplant it into a new Blender, and that should be all that you need to move. Obviously, those image files as well that are in the same directory. The other thing that I'll mention as far as user interface, because this is very, very useful if you're coding. Over here, you've got your Python interpreter. I don't use this a whole lot, but this is like a REPL. You can execute Python code just literally in real time, and it has access to the Blender API. This little area down here is very, very useful. So a software engineering technique is called API first. And Blender, so far as I can tell, very much follows API first. And what API first means is you create an API, something like this in Python, as you're designing a full-blown user interface for something like Blender, and everything that you do, you separate that user interface from the low-level things that are happening, you make sure that your user interface is basically just calling the API, and the API is doing everything. That makes sure that there's not hidden functionality in Blender. Like, how do I do this? I did this in the user interface, but how do I do this in Python? Well, down here, this, this window is essentially a scrolling log of whatever you do. So, like, if I move that that block that I'm about to destroy. Notice the code down here. That is the API code that you would use to render up, or that you would use in the Python to move that block. Now, since this is API first, that means that the API is very attuned to how you're using Blender as a human being. And if you would design an API from scratch just for a computer to use, a Python script, it would probably be a little more streamlined. So you'll notice that as we go through that the Blender API is extremely stateful. And stateful annoys me very much as as a software engineer. I was a software engineer before a data scientist. So the state that you get, obviously there's there's state because there's the, the scene, but the state that you need to manage is which of these objects are selected. Often you'll select an object and then you will manipulate the current object. So that's that's important to get straight in Blender Python. And I'll show you some examples of that as well. So let's go ahead and I commented out some of these functions that I wrote, but I want to show you what they do. So let's uncomment init first, and I'll just show you what init is doing. Init is just right here. And this remove all function, this is something that I got and somewhat modified from Stack Overflow. I mean, where does all code originate stack overflow so it basically deletes all of these objects and it, it does leave some materials around which so it's not a complete big bang but it's it's quite useful and I I like to run this just so that I start from scratch and I don't have to worry about maybe I manually created something that is going to affect the program's run and if you go up to remove all I mean here is remove all so it is taking a type, and if you do specify a type, it's only going to delete that specific type. I usually don't do that. I just big bang it. I remove everything. So going back to init, I call remove all. I create a camera. Now everything is going to happen through the view of the camera. So the location and the rotation. And essentially, 0, 0 is the origin. What I do suggest, I don't have an example of it in here, but you can, there's a look at command that you can use. I tend to like to sometimes have the camera sweep by something, but be being looking at an object. And that, that provides a, 
kind of a cool cinematic sort of effect. I'm going to do another video on neural network visualizations, and believe me, we'll be moving the camera a lot because otherwise 3D is great, but if you never move the camera, you're, you're not getting the full effect of 3D because 3D lets you be able to see things behind that are obscured by other things. So that moves the camera. This is just a function that I wrote or probably modified from Stack Overflow just above. And then I also put a lamp. I put just one lamp into there. I generally use just one or two lamps, or I do three of them and do a photography sort of key lighting effect. But as you've seen from some of my YouTube videos, I'm not necessarily the best at lighting things in, in real world. But this... I use a fairly high energy lamp and place it at this location. So that's where the shadows can be. And what was good about this for the generator that I was doing for the students, I generated a bunch of different light and camera positions and intensities so that they had to deal with doing recognition in very low light situations. Then we generate the floor. And the floor is essentially a, a plane object. You can see the floor here. And that is good because otherwise your objects are just kind of floating out in space. The thing that I will mention about the floor, the plane, here you can see the floor. And this gets into showing the statefulness of Blender. So this is a real good example. Let's talk about how I am building the floor. You do BPY, OPS, so those are the operations, and mesh, and we're going to add a primitive, a plane. We're adding a plane to the world at location 000. zero, zero. And the size is going to be one. Don't make it zero or something. You end up, it's really annoying. I spent probably an hour figuring that out. But basically, if you create a, a zero sized floor, because it's a plane, it, you would think that a plane is infinitely thin. Otherwise, if it's not, what's the difference between a plane and a box? And I honestly don't know that as far as why they set that up that way in Blender. So if anybody does, let me know in the comments. But nonetheless, the plane, if you do, you can make that size as big as you want. It's still infinitely thin, but if you make it zero, then it won't reflect light and it has a stupid kind of look to it. And I'm sad to say that took me maybe an hour or two to figure out because I, I just like, why is my, why is my floor not, not lighting? But then, okay, we've added the object. Then I basically get this I assign it to a variable called PL for plane. And then I could operate on the current object, but I usually like to grab variables to these so that I can keep them and operate on them even though they're not the current object anymore. I name it to ground so that over here in the scene collection, it's gonna show up and I can see it. The scale, that is very important. So I'm resizing it and that's where I'm saying the infinitely thin thing becomes important. Make that a 0 0.1 or something like that. Don't make it a don't make it a 0 or you'll get in, in trouble. It it'll look mostly correct, but it won't it, its light is not going to be right. And then I assign a material to it. And basically, all the materials that I'm doing in this tutorial, they're images. And you're using those images like textures. They just tile them, and that way my blocks look somewhat wooden. And we'll see them in a moment. Rigid body. Now, I am, I do want these blocks to fall over if they're not arranged correctly. So I am setting rigid body physics here. Now, passive, this is important for the floor. And if you're not doing physics, you can leave this off. But the floor has got to be passive. Otherwise, the floor will just drop into the void of, of space. If you've ever fallen out of the bottom of a world in Minecraft, you know what I'm talking about. So you need something. That's the bedrock. That is something that's not going to not going to move and the the other objects will be will be active and they're rigid body meaning they're not going to deform they're not going to like jello all right so that creates the floor and talks about some of the some of the gotchas that i that i ran into and by the way here is where i'm creating all my materials this can be a little a little tricky as well this material for texture i found that also on stack overflow made a few modifications to it and I created all of these materials material red material blue and these are primarily coming from these wood JPEGs that I created now I perhaps could have 
have used just a generic wood image and somehow maybe in Blender tinted them to each of these various colors, but I, I just solved it in Photoshop and created images for each of these various color of wood. And those are all my materials. The material for texture, I'm not going to go through that function. It's just literally right up there, but it's essentially a very easy function that lets you basically pass in the name and then the path. And also notice to the path. So I I like to always use full paths in Python. So I'm using OS path join. That way I'm not surprised at where my files end up. And I have a path defined up at the top of this that is that is where these are all coming from. And then basically I have several functions that render a couple of the scenes that I wanted for, for this assignment. So I'm going to go ahead and uncomment overhead and save it. And then we're going to actually run it. And notice over here, this is going to move around a bit. Right, so we've re-rendered this scene. You can go look at it basically over there. I'm going to go ahead and just render it though. If I render and render image, there we have it. And that's the way that I am currently lighting it. These are the building blocks that I've defined. So I've created functions that let me create these building blocks. This, I think you call this a unit block set. I had one of these as a kid and I built all kinds of, of things with the with my wooden building blocks. So now I'm kind of recreating this in the, in the Blender world. So this is a very common set of blocks and colors. Some of you might be, let me know in the comments if you, any other children of the 80s that played with these, these types of blocks. So the render, you can, you can basically go to image and you can save it and put it elsewhere. I like to render it programmatically as well because for the assignment, I was generating like 10,000 of these and you don't want to do that manually. Always automate the boring stuff. Great book. So then I have a few other configurations too, like line up, run that. And now if I render it, you can see these blocks more lined up. This is basically artwork that I was generating for the Kaggle competition so that I could show them what the blocks that they were dealing with. So I'll close that. Let's look at how I'm actually building these objects though. If we go into lineup, what I am doing essentially here is I've created some functions. So I've created a function like blue block, red block, yellow block, and I call those over and over again, and it's basically creating the scene so that I can then render it. And what I pass in are really two things, the location of the block, and these are not really in Blender coordinates. These are in grid coordinates that I kind of made up for the scene. So if we render the image, these are unit blocks. So if you think of essentially that orange block that you see there as, as a unit, two of those basically make up a blue block, two blue blocks basically make up a red block, and two red blocks basically make up a yellow block, the big long yellow block. So that's, I'm basically, each of those units in that grid is one half of the the orange block because the orange block you could put two orange blocks on their side and that would be equal to the height of that so essentially half of the orange block is the grid system that we're dealing with and it's x y and z so to line those all up i basically just found out the locations on the grid that i wanted to line them up to and then the true false false that's the rotation because these blocks Sure, I can place them wherever I want to, but they can be re rotated, and I only allow 90-degree rotations because I want them to, to stand up nicely on each other. So everything has got to be perfectly 90-degree aligned. It's a perfect OCD world. Okay, so I call each of those and we can do the overhead view. I have a little more complicated one here where I build a house. We'll see that in a second. But this is how I created all of the blocks. Now I am lazy and do not like to type any more code than I need to. So that's why I create red block, blue block, all of those. And in here, I have a base block and the base block. So this defines a red block and all the blocks are defined off of the base block and I just pass in the material that I want to use, the rotation. This comes directly from the, the instantiation of this red block. 
the rotation and location. The material is defined by the type of block that it is. But then this is the size of it. So a red block is basically four of those units in one direction, two in the other, and then one single unit high. And all of these, you can see on down, is how I basically am defining all of these various blocks. And then this last one, it's called is cube. I didn't necessarily name that the best. It's basically should it be beveled. So let's render real quick. And you can't quite see it here, but if you zoom in to these these blocks, they have a a beveled edge on the each of these because if you if you cut that completely sharp with no bevel like the blocks that the children are playing with, they're going to get splinters. <laughs> so that's kind of mean. And things in the real world, they're not usually hard razor sharp edges. So some of the blocks I do want to bevel most of them. The only two that I really don't want to bevel are that yellow cylinder block and the purple cylinder block because if I beveled those it, it just wouldn't look right. They're, they're already cylinders so I don't do that. So let's look at the base block because this this has a lot of information that is that is useful here. So I get the location passed in, and the location is in my unit grid, hypergrid really, because it's 3D. And I'm going to create a location 2, which is essentially a translation of the unit hypergrid. And I basically create it this way. So I'm, set, I'm offsetting these blocks so that they're kind of at the edge where I wanted them on the, on the floor. And I have to calculate a footprint of each of them, because that way I know how to really properly offset them. So if I render the image, the footprint of this blue block depends on how it's rotated. So I have to know what the footprint is. If this yellow block, if it's down on the ground like this, it's got a very large footprint. But if I set it upright like a skyscraper, it doesn't have that big of a footprint. So that's what I'm doing there. And those footprints allow me to properly offset them. I won't take you through all the math of, of how I did that. It's relatively simple, simple math. Then I basically add my rigid body for the, the block itself. Oh, and by the way, if it is a cylinder, I am... So if it's a cylinder type object, then I have to do a different add. I'm adding a cylinder. So if it's a cubicle type one, then really box, not necessarily cube. I am going to use the primitive add cube, and I'm also going to put that bevel on that I was talking about so that it's not sharp and unrealistic looking and dangerous. Here I am creating the, the cylinder, and then I have to define the rigid body. Notice it's active because I do want these blocks to fall. They'll fall through space and hit the, hit the floor at, at some point. And then the rotation, I basically calculate the rotation so that I, I move it to the correct orientation. And Blender uses Euler's, Euler's, I think it's pronounced Euler. That is essentially a, it's not radians, it's not degrees. I don't claim to have sat down and understood the math behind an Euler, but it's, it's, a, it's pretty common in 3D packages. I've used them often. Usually I just translate radians into those or degrees. And depending on if degrees or radians are the most useful for what I'm trying to do. So that's the, the base block. And you can also see, too, that I keep, I keep a, a copy of the block, although I throw that away, but I do, like to, I do like to keep them rather than just constantly operating on the current object. All right, so let's go back to the, to the bottom, and I'll show you the house function because that's just a, a little more complicated. It's putting, it puts down several, so we don't have, just have one of each block. We have several. And now you can see the little house in the background. And let me go ahead and render it. And there's the block house. So I used all those unit blocks to build a very, very simple house. If I wanted to get fancy with the camera, I could even do a fly through or, or something like that. I could shoot a ball at it and blow it up. Those are very popular videos on Blender on YouTube. And I couldn't resist. I did do one where I, I shot a ball at a very large block object. You can see it here. Destroying things is lots of fun. Then the other thing I will show you too is I do have a function here called called render. 
So this is how you just programmatically render it after you've moved the camera, the lights, everywhere you want to. You can just render this right to a file and save it. And this is how I generated like 10,000 some odd of these images. And you just really have to pass in the resolution X and Y. So I was rendering it to HD resolution so that it fits nicely into Premiere when I create the YouTube video. I use Premiere, I use Camtasia. And that's pretty much it. This is my intro into, into Blender. Thank you for watching this video. And if you're interested in all things artificial intelligence and even some 3D rendering like we did in this video with artificial intelligence and ML, Definitely subscribe to my channel and please give me a like for this video. Thank you very much.